battle that is, it is a titanic battle as to who really will influence this next generation. We're in a titanic battle. And I appeal to you, if we all are not trying to reach the next generation of young people, young adults, teenagers, middle schoolers, elementary kids, if we're not serious about trying to do that, how do we survive in the 21st century? How do we make it? It's a challenge. It's a challenge that we got to respond to. And if we don't respond to it, then on our watch, we'll see the steady decline of this church. Well, Jesus ushers in a new paradigm for ministry. See, we, we missed it. That's what Jesus was doing. He, he brought a whole new paradigm. The Jews were determined, this is how you worship God. This is the way you do it. This is how God is to be worshipped. Jesus brings in a whole new paradigm. He says, no, those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's not by Jerusalem. It's not by, by Samaria. It's about a heart relationship with God. It was a whole new model, a whole new paradigm for ministry, and they couldn't see it. So they rejected him. They rejected him because they were not prepared to accept the fact that he was telling them that change is now here on the scene and change is what the kingdom of God has to do to be relevant to the current generation. Well, after his death, burial, and crucifixion, his disciples, they all flee. And so now the women, they come to tell the story and they said just idle fables. So in verse 13, after the empty tomb in verse 1 through 12, there was this Emmaus walk in verse 13 through 32, which I read in your hearing for the context, because it's not a familiar passage. So after his resurrection, Christ was able to veil his identity. Now, the Bible doesn't go into specifics as to how he did that, but he was able to veil his identity or to put a veil over the eyes of people where they did not recognize who he was until he chose to reveal himself to them. Now, I believe that that has some real significance because I think that's the way God still works. Paul talks about that. In one of the Corinthian letters, Paul says, if our gospel be hid, hidden, it is hidden to those who are lost, whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded their eyes lest they see the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. And so it's the Holy Spirit of God that removed the shell the scales, the blindness from people's eyes, they can see their own predicament and they can see Christ as the only hope of salvation. That's why I tell people often, you don't get saved when you want to. It don't happen like that. You get saved when that window of opportunity presents itself, when the Holy Spirit removes the scales from your eyes for that moment in time where you can see your own wretched sinful condition and you can see your only hope is to fall and, and for God's mercy and receive God's offer of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That is when you can get saved. Salvation is not a process. It is a crisis event. It is a dramatic crisis event. When heaven invades a person's soul, he pulls back the blindness of darkness so they can see the glory of Christ and people embrace Christ. So you get saved at that moment. And if you choose to reject the offer of salvation at that moment, you may never even feel like getting saved again. It may never press hard enough on you. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. It's not tomorrow. The only time that we have is now. It is the present to live in this, this, this tension of the fierce urgency of now. You see, you see that in the Bible. You see how Jesus called people to a regimented commitment in the present, not in the future. It was always about the present. The man said, Lord, I want to follow you, but let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said, let somebody else bury him. Let the dead bury the dead. This is your opportunity to hitch your wagon with me. If you want to do something with your daddy, you should have did it while he was alive. You follow me. You follow me. So salvation is that crisis experience. And that's what the gospel is all about. So these men are having a conversation. And so Jesus, incognito, enters into their 
conversation. And in verse 17, he says, what, what are y'all talking about? What conversation are you having as you're walking? Why is your heart so heavy? Why are you so sad? Why are you so, so down and melancholy? And then Brother Cleopas says, man, where you been? <laughs> what rock did you just get away from? Have you not heard? Have you not heard that Jesus of Nazareth has been on the scene? A man mighty in deeds, a man mighty in works. Have you not heard about him? And that the chief priests and the rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and they crucified him. And we were hoping, we were hoping that he, he was who he said he was, the redeemer of Israel. And now three days have passed and we haven't heard anything from him. But certain women say that he's been, they been, they went to the tomb, they say he'd been raised from the dead. When they didn't find his body, in verse 25, he says, Oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And so then Luke says, he then begins with Moses. And so that is a way of saying he goes back to the Old Testament. He goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. And he starts to open the scripture to them that they might see where the Christ, he was the seed of woman in Genesis 3.15. The Christ, he was the Passover lamb that Moses instructed the people they had to slay in the book of Exodus. The Christ, he was the kinsman redeemer they were talking about when the, old, the, the, the nexus of kin had to redeem the land. He's the kinsman redeemer. He goes to the Old Testament record showing that it was the Christ, it was the Christ, it was the Christ. He's the seed of woman. It was the Christ, he was the seed of Abraham that would bring a blessing to the whole world. It was the Christ that the tabernacle pointed to. It was the Christ that was the way into the Holy of Holies. So it expounds the scripture unto them. And so that's why biblical preaching is important. <laughs> because we need to remember what God has said because we have a tendency to, to forget. And time and trouble and pressure and stress and disappointment and heartache and letdowns, all those things can cause our hope to be dampened. We need to be reminded that God is still God all by himself. He's still God all by himself. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of think we need some, some kind of better health care system where we can't let have. I don't know what the right answer is, but if they don't pass, I just keep taking the aspirin every now and then, going to see the doctor when I can, doing the best that I can with what I have. But the Christ, after a while and by and by, is going to come back. He's going to change these vile bodies to be like his glorious body. These earthly bodies are going to put on a heavenly body, so I'll do the best I can with this raggedy body down here. But I know that this earthly tabernacle, it's been dissolved. I already told my family, I done put it down in writing. When the man say, ain't nothing else we can do to help the boy, don't hook me up to nothing, don't let him give me, just let me go up out of here to see the Christ. He didn't put me here to stay. I know I wasn't put here to stay, so why I want to be put on some type of machine so people can come stand all over you, God, oh, what a shame, oh, what a shame. He preached mighty sermons, oh, what a shame. He talked about Christ being raised from the dead. Can he not raise himself? No, no, no. Just let me go. Let me go. If I ain't did no good, now think about it. If I haven't did no good when I had two lungs that work, a heart that worked right, hands and feet, vocal cord, if I didn't do no good then, what am I going to do good laying up in the hospital on the ventilator? How am I going to help somebody? I'm just taking good health care that could be going to someone else that could be helped. These are sermons the church don't want to preach. We want to talk about this fact that every now and then we got to re recognize our own mortality. Now, I'm not talking about going and kill your grandmama. Now, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> no, don't, don't say nobody remember when I say that. But it used to be a time, what did we do when we were back down in the country where I came from? What no hospital in Mount Hope, West Virginia? Where people got real sick and you couldn't take them to the hospital, you just brought them home and you took care of them the best you could. You fed them, you bathed them, you clothed them, you prayed for them, you talked to them, did the best you could. And when that time came, you let them go. We let them go. We're trying to find immortality in the technology of medicine. And we'll bank ourselves trying to become immoral. I told y'all once, I'm going to tell y'all again. I've been listening to these talking heads for months, trying to figure out health care insurance reform, trying to figure out what does all that mean. What does it mean about the public option? What does it mean about a pre-existing condition? What does all this mean? For me and the ones I'm responsible for, but the most important lesson I learned, I told y'all, I learned it from the king of pop. I learned it from Michael Jackson.